You know, as we, as we still have 2020 visible in our rearview mirror, and we are setting our sights on this journey into 2021, I think we have this temptation to try to evaluate the year that we're coming out of and maybe even have this anticipation over the year that we are headed into. We, we tend to evaluate it uh, with this measurement of enjoyment. We ask ourselves questions like, well, did we have fun or did we have hardship? And the answers to those questions we often use to put on this imaginary scale and we use it to say, well, we had a good year, we had a bad year, based on the answers to questions like, well, did we have fun, was it enjoyable, was it pleasant, or was it, or was it not? And as we look towards 2021, uh, I'm sure you maybe have either said it or have heard people say, boy, I hope things get better next year. And we often make uh, statements like that in the hopes that that imaginary scale will tip heavily towards pleasant experiences and be feather light with the unpleasant experiences. What if, what if we are using the wrong measurement tool when we're evaluating uh, 2020, when we're looking forward to and uh, looking into 2021? What if we are trying to measure temperature With a tape measure, it's not going to work well. We're going to come up with the wrong measurement. I want you to look at Ephesians chapter 5 with me, if you would. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 and 16. If you don't have your Bible with you, it's up on the screen. Good practice in 2021. Bring your Bible so you can follow along. Follow along on the digital notes as well. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 starts out with these really important words. So be careful how you live. Be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Well, how do we do that? How do we, how do we make sure that we're careful about how we live, that we're not living foolish lives, but we're living with wisdom? How do we do it? Verse 16, make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. And the first part of that, It's probably pretty easy. Make the most of every opportunity. And we need to make sure that we're not wasting opportunities that are in front of us in this coming year. That's really good advice for all of us. But I don't want you to miss the context in which that is said. Did you notice the part in verse 16 that says, because the days are evil, because the experiences are difficult, because the environment is harsh, Because what you're going through is unpleasant. Make the most of every opportunity, even when things in life are unpleasant or challenging or difficult. The measurement then of evaluation, when we talk about uh, the year past or the year coming up, it's not, uh, did we have a good year? Did we have a, a bad year? Is this a good day? Is this a bad day? No, the measurement of evaluation is, did you and I, Make the most of the opportunities before us, whether it was a good experience or a bad experience. Because in both of those situations, there are opportunities to do things that matter to God. Did we make the most of those opportunities or did we waste them? You ever watch a movie and at the end of the movie, as the credits are rolling, you you say to yourself, well... You know, there's two wasted hours of my life I'm never going to get back. I think I've had that thought after every Nicolas Cage movie I've ever watched. Right? No, that's not true. Uh, National Treasure was pretty cool. But other than that, they were all garbage, right? A waste of time. Now, maybe this is not going to sound like bad news to some of you. Maybe you'll be like, yay, but we're not going to get to go back and do 2020 over again. And some of you are like, yes, goodbye, good riddance to 2020. But think, think about it like this, before you cheer too loudly. There were some really important opportunities set before us last year. And if we wasted those opportunities, we're not getting them back. We don't get to go back and do a do-over. Whatever has been done is done. Whatever wasn't done, wasn't done. And if we wasted that year in some way, it's over, we can't go back. So that might be some bad news for some, but listen, here's some good news. The good news is 2020 is just getting started. We're like three days into it, aren't we? 
is just getting started. And although you and I have very little control over how many pleasant or unpleasant experiences lie in front of us in 2021, every day this year, every experience that you and I go through is an opportunity for us to do something that matters to God if we don't waste it, if we don't waste it. I think there's, when we talk about, you know, things that we do that have value and things that we do that are a waste of time, I think there's always this tension. Well, who gets to decide that? You know, do you get to decide that for me? Should I get to decide that for you of what's a valuable use of your time and what's a waste of time? You know, there's some people that uh, they really enjoy going hunting, right? But there's other people that look at those who go hunting out in the woods, spend all day in the woods in the cold looking for animals and that they see that as a waste of time. They're like, well, just go to the store and buy some meat. Why are, you, why are you doing that? But those who enjoy hunting, they see the value in what they are doing. It's nice to be somewhere quiet and just unplug from all the noise for a little while, right? Especially if your life is stressful to have a quiet place to go and unplug from that or maybe pray. It would be a really good thing. Lots of value in it for people to enjoy that. There are people who, who would say, well, sports, sports is, is a waste of time. Just read a book, right? Do something better with your time than sports. Why don't you learn a skill, learn how to do some woodworking or something, and, and then you can contribute something uh, profitable, something that actually matters to uh, the world around you, right? People think that about sports, but those who, uh, who enjoy sports, they see great value in learning lessons about teamwork, in learning lessons about discipline and in uh, how uh, hard work can pay off uh, when you, uh, when you uh, are playing sports, what it takes to be good at something, right? It's, it's hard work. It's dedication. It's discipline. It's sacrifice. These are, these are good values. And so when we're talking about how do we assign uh, this is a, a good use of your time and this is not a good use of your time, when we're talking about those kind of things, we have to be very careful uh, that we are not putting ourselves in place of the, as the arbiter of those decisions of what's valuable. We need to look to God and ask Him to help us decide what's a good use of our time and what is not. In fact, in Psalm 94, I'm sorry, Psalm 90 verse 12, the psalmist, he, he uh, prayed this from his heart, teach us to number our days aright that we may gain a heart of wisdom. He was looking to God to help him uh, learn how to apply wisdom to his everyday life so that what he was doing uh, throughout the day was of value and not a waste of time. We need the wisdom of God to learn how to make the most of the opportunities that God sets before us in life. Now, the theme verse for this series is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. And I want to challenge you right up front. We're going to look at this verse all month long, every week. I'm going to bring it up. And I just want to challenge you to work on it as a memory verse. By the end of the month, if you don't know it already, uh, that you would work really hard to have this verse memorized. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will make your paths straight. Some of you might have a different version of that. It might say something like, and He will direct your paths. Whatever version you want to memorize it out of, whatever you're comfortable with, as you have in your lap, use that, memorize this verse. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge Him and He will make your path straight. The reason we're using that particular proverb for this series is because of the imagery of this path. That when we trust God to lead us down the, the path of wisdom, we're going to wind up in places of great value. But if we don't, and we don't look to God, if we try to do life on our own, we're going to wind up going down a fool's path and we're going to wind up in places most likely that we don't want to end up in. And the fool's path to a wasted year, the fool's path maybe even to a wasted life, is to try to live life apart from God. If you are far from God this morning, we want you to know as a church that you don't have to stay there. It's why Jesus came to earth. Jesus is the Son of God. He's God incarnate. And he, he came to this earth for a very important purpose, to die as a sacrifice for our sin on the cross so that you and I could be forgiven of sin, so that you and I could be made right with God. But He didn't just stay dead in the tomb. He rose from the dead. He, 
He rose from the dead three days later, proving his victory over sin, proving his victory over death, but also proving that you and I can have a brand new life, that you and I, our lives can be transformed, that we can take a brand new path. We don't have to stay on this path that we've been carving out for ourselves. No, we can have the wisdom of God in our everyday lives when we trust Christ as our Savior. And if you haven't done that, our prayer, our hope every week is that you will do that today. You know, but even those of you who have been on this path of eternal value for a long time, and I know there's people in this room, there, there's people at home watching right now, and you've, you've been a follower of Jesus, you've been on this path of eternal value for a lot of years. I just want to remind you that we still need to ask God for wisdom to direct our paths every day, to ask God for wisdom to make the most of the opportunities that He sets before us every day. I don't want to get to the end of my life and regret that I wasted years, and I'm, I'm pretty confident that you don't want that either. But let's not trust ourselves to evaluate what has value and what's a waste of time. Let's, let's look to God, let's look to God's Word for insight as we, uh, as we try to evaluate what is a good use of our time and what's not. All right, here's the first one. Why don't you go to Matthew chapter 6 with me? Matthew chapter 6, verse 27. This is a really important uh, insight into what Jesus said was a waste of time. Matthew chapter 26, verse 27. Jesus says, Can all of your worries at a single moment, you might have the phrase, a single hour to your life? Can worry at a moment, can worry at an hour to your life? Answer is no. Worry, fear, waste of time. I wonder if you were to be honest and you look back over 2020, did you, did you waste any time in worry and fear? I'm going to repent publicly before you this morning. How about that? Everyone loves when the preacher fails, right? Everyone loves that. So uh, last night, right? That's pretty fresh, pretty fresh sin in my life. You like that? Last night, uh, you know, our, our two oldest are old enough now where they're able to go out and be with their friends. My, uh, my daughter, Hannah, she's 19, headed back to college uh, next week. And so it's perfectly normal and appropriate. You know, they would want to hang out with their friends, but uh, Hannah didn't get home uh, when I thought she was going to be home. I woke up uh, like, I don't know, 12, 30, 1 o'clock, something like that, and I, I, you know, as dads, as moms, you, know, you hear when people come in the door, and you hear when your kids come in the door, and uh, she hadn't come in, and so uh, we have technology now, and you, did you know you can check to see where your kids are at? Do you know you can do that? Yeah, so I did that. I did that. And she's where she's supposed to be, right? But she wasn't home. And, you know, it's like 1 2 o'clock in the morning. And I'm, instead of doing what I should have done, which we'll get to in just a second, what did I do? I laid there awake and I worried. Is she going to be okay? Is she going to make it home? Right? It's a waste of time. We'll get to in just a second what's a better use of our time. But living in fear, living in worry, it's kind of like, it's kind of like posting uh, something online that you think is going to persuade other people uh, to something that you believe or some argument that you want to make. It's a waste of time because here's what happens. You, pay, you post something and you think it's really persuasive and all the people that agree with your premise, they're like, oh yes, this is great, this is wonderful. And, and all the people that disagree, they're either going to ignore what you have posted and just keep scrolling or they're going to put some dissenting comment on there a different premise, a different conclusion that you're going to look at and say, this is ridiculous. It's a waste of time. Just like worry and fear, living in worry and fear is a waste of time. It's not going to change anything. You know, you know what is a better use of your time? You know what's not a waste of time? Prayer. And eventually, uh, I did get to that last night, and I took some time and I prayed and asked God to watch over her, which is what I should have done in the first place, right? And maybe you've done that. But prayer is not a waste of time. In fact, uh, Philippians 4, 6 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving. What do we do? We make our requests known to God. 
And what happens when we do that? Instead of being anxious, instead of living in worry and fear, instead of doing that, when we pray, when we bring these things to God, what happens is the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, it guards our hearts, it guards our minds from what? From anxiousness, from fear, from worry. Prayer is not a waste of time. Worry and fear is. There's something else uh, from 1 Corinthians that talks about a waste of time in our lives. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Would you look at that with me? 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm going to jump in about halfway down through verse 10. Paul is talking about the gospel in chapter 3 and uh, how he has laid a foundation. Uh, and he, this, this word picture that he's using is it's like building a building. And the gospel is the foundation of this building that we build our lives on. And he says this about halfway through verse 10. Whoever is building on this foundation, the gospel of Jesus Christ, must be very careful. You've got to be careful because no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already laid, uh, which is Jesus Christ. Anyone who builds on that foundation, right? So you've trusted Christ as your Savior. You have the foundation of the gospel in your life. And now you build on it. You make choices on how you're going to live your life. Are you going to continue to live in the uh, transformation of the gospel? Or are you going to have other priorities in your life? These are the kind of questions that get brought up in this, in this illustration. He says, anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials. You get to pick. Here's the, here's the list of materials. G gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay, straw. You get to pick how you're going to build your life. Are you going to use things of value to build your life or things that are worthless, things that are a waste of time? Verse 13 says, On judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value. And if that work survives, well, the builder will receive a reward. If the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. You've got to be very careful how we use our time, very careful how we build our lives, because if we build our lives on things that don't have much value, on things that are temporary, we're going to wind up wasting time, maybe even wasting years. I have, I have this varsity jacket from high school uh, when I played high school football, and, and on the uh, the jacket, it says that we, we won uh, this district championship right, our senior year. That's a nice jacket. It's, uh, when I look at it, it's a good memory. It keeps me warm. Uh, so it's, it's a nice jacket. Uh, but uh, do you, how many people would you think, honestly, if I were to wear that jacket out uh, somewhere, how many people would you think would give a rip about my high school 1993 district championship? No, probably no one, right? They're like, what's this weirdo doing living in 1993? You know, put the jacket away, right? God, I believe, uh, according to Scripture, He wants us to enjoy life. There's nothing wrong with having fun. There's nothing uh, wrong with uh, enjoying life. God has called us to rest. God has called us to enjoy life, right? So there's nothing wrong with uh, having fun. God calls us to do that in life. But I want you to imagine if... If I were to build my life on something like what happened in 1993 with that particular accomplishment, what if I were to build my life on chasing after awards and trophies and certificates, chasing after things that eventually are going to be burned up and you can't take any of that stuff with you? It's not that you can't enjoy life or, or have fun or do some neat things in life. That's not the point. But if we build our lives on and attach our worth and value to things that it will eventually be burned up when the world is gone, and we've wasted years of time. You know what's not a waste of time? We'll find out in Galatians. So flip with me to Galatians chapter 6. So building your life on something temporary, think something that's not truly eternal in value, if you build your life on it, waste of time. But watch, watch what happens in Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. Let's not get tired of doing what is good. You might have the phrase, don't become weary in doing good. At just the right time, 
we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Do you ever do things and you're doing good and it doesn't seem like anyone appreciates it? It doesn't seem like it's, like it's even mattering to anyone. It's not making a difference. Paul says, don't, don't give up. Don't get tired. Don't grow weary in doing good. Keep at it. It's not a waste of time. He says, therefore, uh, whenever we have the opportunity, make the most of these opportunities to do good for everyone especially to those in the family of faith. So one of the things that's never a waste of time is doing good for others. You're doing good if no one appreciates it, if no one notices it, if it doesn't seem like it's making a difference, do it anyway. Continue to do good. It's not a waste of time. Add to that what Paul writes to the church in, in Colossians chapter 4. Well, check this one out. Colossians chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Paul writes, live wisely among those who are not believers. Let's make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. Living well, whether it seems like it's making a difference or not, continue to live well, continue to obey Christ, continue to follow Him. Doing good, living well, making the most of the opportunities that are in front of us, that God places in our path, will never be a waste of time. Even if you don't see the fruit of it, this side of heaven. You know, when 2020 started, uh, this live stream that we're, that we're doing today was not on our radar. It, wasn't, you know, it was something we had talked about as a staff, something we probably would have got to eventually. And, ah, that's a good thing. We should probably look at that. But 2020 kind of forced us into it, and uh, even though it wasn't part of our original agenda, uh, it became necessary, and that technology is, as you can see, sometimes it's not cooperative, sometimes it can be frustrating, uh, but uh, I'm glad, I'm glad that, uh, that we're using it, because it's been really good for a lot of people, it's been really good for a lot of people. Um, maybe... 2020 has uh, caused you to uh, make some changes in your life. I know uh, for a lot of us, uh, it forced us to slow down, right? You're not having to run from this thing to this thing and this thing, you know, because everything got canceled. And when stuff got canceled, it was frustrating, it was disappointing and all of that. But there was something good about spending some more time at home with our families. For a lot of us, that was that was probably really good. And maybe, maybe 2020 forced some changes in your life that you weren't planning on. Here's the truth. 2021 may have some things in it that aren't going to be any easier than 2020 was. That doesn't mean that we can't make the most of the opportunities in front of us to do good and to live well. 2021 might be great, might be problem-free, probably not might be some really significant challenges. doesn't matter. There's still opportunities in front of us this coming year to do good and to live well. You know, Jesus told this parable in Matthew 25 about a master who, who went away on this long trip, and he entrusted three of his servants with, with uh, treasure, with opportunity, with time, and uh, with resources. And they, they weren't all given the same amount of resources. They had different amounts that the master entrusted them with, but they all had opportunity. They all had time to do something of value, something that mattered to the priorities of the master. And, and two of them did that. Two of them uh, did exactly what uh, the master had requested of them, and uh, their, his priorities were their priorities. And there was a reward for that. But one of those servants was afraid. One of those servants was lazy, and he did nothing. He did nothing with those resources, time, and opportunity that the master had given to him. He wasted those years in fear and misplaced priorities. I know 2020 forced a lot of changes upon us and a lot of, quite frankly, unpleasant experiences. But you know what it also did? It also provided some incredible opportunities for us to live out our faith, for us to demonstrate the love of God for us to strengthen some relationships in our lives, for us to perhaps even take a risk for the sake of the gospel. And I just want us to think uh, briefly, you know, how, how, did we, how did we respond to those opportunities? What did we do with them? Did we use them? Did we even look for those opportunities? Or we, were we self, uh, so self-consumed with our own story, our own world, 
We didn't even look for these opportunities. That's a waste of time and opportunity. Matthew 6 tells us about something that's not. Matthew 6, if you go back there, you know, I told you about Jesus saying that worry and fear is a waste of time. Well, then at the end of that passage and that chapter, uh, Jesus then tells us something that's not a waste of time. So go to Matthew 6, look at verse 33. Seek the kingdom of God above all else. In first priority, in first position in our lives is the kingdom of God. The things, the priorities that matter to God. Seek those things first above all else and live righteously. Live well, do good, live well, and He will give you everything else. Let everything else in the hands of God. He knows what you need. Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will take care of itself. There's enough trouble, he says, today. Seven, chapter 7, verses 24 and 25, he then tells this, this story, this parable about uh, someone. He says, anyone who listens to my teaching, who follows it, is wise. He's like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents, then the flood waters rise, and the winds beat against that house. Has your year felt like that in some ways? It won't collapse. Why? Because it's built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and does not obey, it's foolish. It's like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and the floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. Living a Jesus-centered life will never be a waste of time. I just had a funeral, a funeral yesterday for this dear old man, uh, 97 years old, uh, Junior Unks. We mentioned uh, him and Louise um, in our announcement package. Louise's funeral is uh, this afternoon. Uh, 94 years old, uh, sweet dear lady. These were longtime partners uh, here at our church. And neither one of them are famous. Neither one of them are rich. Their names aren't going to appear on some building somewhere. Their names aren't going to appear in a history book. But you need to know that both Junior and Louise had a tremendous impact in people's lives, in the lives of their family members, in the lives of their friends, in the life of this church, in my life. Junior Angst read the Bible through. Did you ever try to read the Bible the whole way through, like Genesis, all the way to Revelation? There's Bible plans that you can get that take you through the whole Bible in a year. He did that. He did that 45 years in a row. No, you celebrate. That's incredible. How many of us could say we even read through the Bible once from beginning to end? 45 years. I always loved and appreciated sitting down at a men's Bible study or men's grace group with, with Junior around that table. and uh, It would just be incredible to hear his wisdom and insight. You know, We would look at a Bible passage, and oftentimes he wouldn't have to look it up because he had it memorized. He could just quote it to us. It was amazing. And what I appreciate so much about his example of living a Jesus-centered life is that as, as I watched him, he, and there was other young guys. My son was, uh, at the time, he was involved in that men's uh, grace group. He was a little younger, and, and I would take him with me, and uh, there were some other young guys around that table with him, and he inspired us to put a huge priority of Scripture in our own lives, because we saw the difference that it made in his. Louise, uh, if you ever, I don't know if some of you know her or not, but she, if you ever met her, you wouldn't forget it. Sweet, kind, she's the kind of lady that would make you feel like you are so special when you when you would be in her presence. But what I want you to know about Louise is this. Louise prayed for our church. She prayed for you every single day. And when I say she prayed for you, I don't mean like, eh, Lord, you know, bless Lamersville. That's not what I mean. I mean, she prayed for you every day. And to be quite honest, if we don't have other people who will step up and, and be prayer warriors like Louise, we are going to feel that loss in ways that we can't even see yet. That's the kind of prayer warrior Louise was. You don't have to be famous. You don't have to be rich. If you live a Jesus-centered life, it's never a waste of time because you are making an impact in people's lives. 
that you may not even see this side of heaven. One more, all right? We're going to finish up here. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. One more thing that will never be a waste of time in your life. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And we're going to go to verse 24. 1 Corinthians 9, 24. We've already looked at this, this word picture of building a house. And here's another word picture of running a race, right? Our lives are like running a race. And, and Paul says, don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs? Now, he's talking about an actual, an actual physical race. Everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize. So run to win. If you're going to be in the race, if you're going to train, if you're going to run anyway, why not do your best? Why not run to win? All the athletes, they're disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away. They train really, really hard. They sacrifice. They discipline themselves. And they do it so they can win a, a medal or a trophy that'll burn up when the world's gone. That they don't get to take it with them when they die, but they train hard for that temporary reward. But we do it, he says. We, he's switching now to this, this, uh, this spiritual race that you, are, uh, you and I are in. We are running for an eternal prize towards things that really do matter to God and really do matter in eternity. So he says, here's, a, here's his conclusion, verse 26. I'm going to run with purpose. Every step of my life, I'm going to run with purpose. I'm going to discipline myself like, a, like an athlete. When Paul talks here uh, about the gospel, and, and really he's talking about prioritizing the gospel in his life, it's not just prioritizing sharing the gospel. He's talking about prioritizing living the gospel in his life. That's the image that he's painting with this race. You know, when you and I talk about the gospel, it's important that we understand that, yes, the gospel is uh, the message of salvation from hell. It is the message of forgiveness from sin and eternal life and being made right with God. It is that, but it's also the message of transformation. The, gospel, the, 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 the good news of the gospel is that we're not just left in our sin, uh, that we, uh, we are made brand new. We, we were given a brand new heart, and God wants to transform our lives. He wants to put us on a brand new path that is of eternal value. So when we talk about living the gospel, that's what we're talking about. Not just experiencing the gospel of salvation, but living and prioritizing the gospel in our lives every day. And that will never be a waste of time. You know, I look at Paul's example in his life. I look at the example of the Apostle Peter and other men like him. These are guys who went to prison for the sake of the gospel. These are men who eventually would be killed for their faith in Jesus. And I'm wondering how many of us would prioritize the gospel in our lives to that degree. You know, we've seen such a, a high priority in our country on health and safety. And I think in, in increasing measure over the last probably 20 years or so. Well, it's a bad thing. It's just, it's different. It's becoming a, a greater and higher degree of priority and value in our country. You know, I can remember when I was a kid, to be nothing for uh, someone who had a pickup truck and, you know, get a bunch of five-year-olds or ten-year-olds, hey, everybody get in the back of the truck. Right? And you ride down the road and three of them would fall out. Oh, you're fine, right? We, we had friends that had one of those uh, station wagons that had uh, the hatchback. Uh, did you ever do this when you were kids? Some of you are like, what? Yeah, we, we would get in the back of these hatchbacks as kids, like four of us back there. You hit the bumps, so boom, off the ceiling. We loved it. It was great. Can't do that today, right? It's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, I'm, I'm glad that we have seat belts in our cars. I'm, uh, I'm glad for, you know, bike helmets are good, right? When I was a kid, uh, no one, I didn't know anybody, any of my friends that had a bike helmet. I think pretty, I'm pretty confident that if one of us would have showed up uh, together with a bike helmet, they'd have kicked you off the bike and then beat you with a bike helmet. I'm pretty sure that's how that would have gone. Like, what are you doing? Right? Bike helmets are good. I don't want, I don't want my kids getting hurt either. There's a lot of things about health and safety I think that are good. I'm glad, I'm glad we finally figured out smoking is bad. It's hard for me to imagine there was a time in, in our nation's history in which uh, people were like, yeah, this is really good for my health. Oh, I think I'll have another, right? And they're like, they had no clue, really, no clue that that was going to hurt your lungs. 
So I'm glad that we figured that out along the way, and we finally put some warnings on things, and we're trying to help people uh, live healthy lives. I'm glad that we have agencies, government agencies, that have set standards for food and drugs that we put into our bodies. I think that's a good thing, right? I'm, I'm thankful for that. I don't even mind, you know, the, the weird x-ray machines that you go through at the airport. I don't know what they're looking at, but you know, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with taking my shoes off. I don't want to blow up on a plane either. So it's not that health and safety are priorities that we should abandon. I think it, they're good priorities. But I just want to ask you a hard question. Should health and safety, although it's a, a good value, it's a good priority, should it be the greatest priority in our lives? Should it be of greater priority than, let's say, the gospel? Would we ever have a missionary that would ever leave this country for a foreign land if health and safety were the greatest priority? Would we, would we ever have any Christians in places like China or Afghanistan if health and safety were the greatest Priority. Would there ever be a gathering of Christians in Nigeria if health and safety were the greatest priority? Would we ever have any inner city ministries to, to prostitutes and, and to gangs and to junkies? Would, would anyone care enough to go and minister and share the gospel with people in the inner city if, if health and safety were the greatest priority? I don't think God is calling any of us to abandon all regard for health and safety. You know, I'm not saying, hey, bring in the rattlesnakes. Let's see who really has faith. That's not what I'm talking about. People who tell you you need to get bit by a snake or you need to send this chain letter on Facebook and uh, you need to give a bunch of money just to prove your faith, they're wasting your time. Don't listen to them. You don't have to prove your faith to other people. You don't... You, have, you, you don't have to impress anyone. You have one to honor, God. That's it. But maybe there will be opportunities for us in 2021 to actually step out in faith and to trust God with some things that are scary. Like living a Jesus-centered life in a culture that is becoming increasingly hostile towards a biblical worldview. That can be scary. Are we going to step out in faith in 2021 and live a Jesus-centered life anyway? Sharing your faith can be scary. And I'm not saying every single conversation you ever have with people has to be about the gospel or you're wasting, wasting time. That's not what I'm saying. But is it possible that we could be more intentional than we have been in the past about sharing our faith in Jesus and what God's been doing in our lives with other people? Probably. I think we all are looking forward to the day, I won't speak for everyone, but I think most of us are looking forward to the day when we are all gathered together again as an entire church family. I'm looking forward to that. But what if, what if we continually looked for, and maybe you did in 2020, but especially in 2021, we have these opportunities. What if we continue to look for these opportunities not just gather and looking forward to gathering again, but what if we look for these opportunities to be the hands and feet of Jesus in our communities and at our schools and where we work, in our, in, in our families? And maybe it'll require risk. Maybe it'll require a little bit more effort than we put forth in 2020. That's okay. It'll be worth it. And I also think we need to consider the possibility that there may come a day, you look at the example of, uh, of Peter and, and, and Paul from Scripture. You look at the example in Hebrews chapter 11, people that were tortured and, and stoned and sawed in half. There may come a day, maybe not to that extreme, I don't know, but there may come a day when you and I have to make a decision between health and safety and following Jesus. What are we going to do with that opportunity? What are we going to do with that opportunity? I think we should give some honest thought to that because there are things in our lives that are of value, health, safety being one of them, but what about comfort? What about pleasure? Those are the kind of things that are valuable to us, but are they more valuable than the gospel? Guys, we're not getting back 2020. I know some of you are like, good riddance, right? We're not getting it back, though. If we wasted that year in some way, it's over. We don't get a do-over. The good news is 2021 is 
is just getting started. And although you and I have little control over how many pleasant experiences, how many unpleasant experiences, that's true every year. That's not just true this year. That's always been true. You and I have these opportunities every single day to do something that matters to God. Maybe you look back over 2020 and, and you see some missed opportunities. You wanted to read through the Bible and you, you didn't do it. You didn't have time or whatever it was. And, well, you had time to you know, finish the series on Netflix you've been binging. You intended to start family devotions. You, you intended to pray together as a family. You intended to write cards of encouragement to people. You intended to be more generous. You, you intended to make your marriage a greater priority. You intended to, to, to connect with your church family by joining a, a grace group and make that a priority and fill in the blank. It didn't happen. Nobody but God saw what was going to play out last year. That's still true of 2021. My, my hope, I'm sure your hope, is that 2021 will be a little bit more normal, right? That it'll, it'll be better in some ways. I get that. I feel that tension. But how about this? What if it's worse? Is that going to rock your faith? What if it's amazing? Like, what if it's the best year ever? Is that what it's going to take for you to be confident in your faith? That it has to be like a problem-free year? Or you just, I don't know. What if, what if uh, half the year is just spectacular and the other half of the year is garbage? Are you going to be like, well, I'm kind of going to follow Jesus, but I don't know, I'm not all the way in until things get better in my life. 1 Corinthians 10, 31, it's on the screen, watch it. It says simply this, whether you eat, whether you drink, whatever you do, do it for whose glory? What's it say? Do it for the glory of God. If what you're doing... Is something that you can't do for the glory of God, it's probably a waste of time. It might have value. It might not be a sin. But it may be that uh, it doesn't have the same amount of value to it that, that it's worth putting more energy, more time into than something else that is of greater eternal value, something that matters to God. And who do we need to help us figure all that out? We, we need the wisdom of God. We need the Holy Spirit to help us figure that out day by day, to have discernment and wisdom to help us make sure that what we're doing and what we're spending our time in every day matters and has value. That's the priorities of God. If you can do it for the glory of God, it'll never be a waste of time.